Alright. Let me make that sense. Alright, let's bow our heads. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's kick off Easter service real quickly. Heavenly Father, praise be to your holy, holy, holy name today as we get together today, Father, corporately to worship you and to praise you, to celebrate the, this event that is just the encapsulating event of our Christianity, Father. Thank you. Thank you for your plan of salvation in your Son, Jesus Christ. For Father, we're reminded, especially yesterday during that moment, we're just reminded of exactly what He did for us. I forget that sometimes throughout the days and the weeks and the months, but Father, please help me and all of us remember all that stuff that He endured on our behalf. Heavenly Father, we have several people we want to lift up to you right now. I want to lift up Curtis for his health, especially his head health. Hopefully there's things uh, not going on there too seriously, Father. We just want to lift him up to you and, and ask you to touch that situation. We also want to pray for Brittany and her family, Father. Her mom is going through an ordeal this first time without her mom's mom. And we just want to pray that she can uh, weather this storm and find the comfort and the peace and the strength in your word, Father. That's where she'll find it. Also want to pray, pray for the Sharon Adams family. Father, you know what's going on there this morning. And um, they said he was a Christian, so we are trusting and the fact that He is with you right now, Jesus. What a celebration that is for that family. It is sad for them, but we are very happy for Him. And then finally, Father, I want to pray for an unspoken request for Ron and his family as they uh, deal with their situation. And finally, Father, as I close this prayer and we get ready to meet and greet, help me with the message today. I, uh, I want to speak words that are accurate and true and correct. Please, Father, just guide me on this whole process today as we celebrate our risen Savior the man who died for us and rose so that we may be saved. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Let's meet and greet. Then we're going to sing a lot. Yeah. Are you Papa? <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah. Yeah. You know, just before we start, uh, I have to confess, I've been told before that I don't quit picking on this thing and will never heal. So. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a heart and ego driven. I'm nothing on my own. I make mistakes. I often slip. Just common flesh and bone, but I prove someday just what I say. I have a special time for when He was on the cross. I
Go ahead and start that. You will. That has a really long intro or introduction to it. I don't know why it does. I guess because whoever wrote it decided to make it a long. Um, I should have probably said a song about um, he is risen, but I will always be more amazed at the fact that he chose to die for me. It's a symbol that's been used so frequently. Many blaspheme and despise, though it's ancient in our minds. A shrine to death that stands for life to me. There was a cross made for the sun. I'm like, sure, I'm in the game. I'll contribute. What do you want me to do? 
And her answer was, I don't know, just do it. And I'm like, what? You don't know how uncomfortable it is for me to just do it, right? <laughs> I am very, I don't know what the right word is, but I'm that guy. So I'm stressing on that. I'm asking everybody I can ask, how is this supposed to go? And the answer is, just wing it. <laughs> so I get to the Holy Week service, and I hear I'm, I'm prepared to wing it. And not one person told me I had to sing besides the world's greatest singer. <laughs> not one person told me that. So here I'm standing beside Russ singing, and that guy, whoo, he can sing. He can belt it out. And I'm like, I'm just, finally I got to the point where I said, screw this, I'm singing as loud as I can. <laughs> and so he was so gracious with him being on that. But that's how my week started. And then let's fast forward to today. I get up pretty early. And I'm watching the news, and I see this headline on the news. It says, from the New York Times, it's time to kill God. And I'm thinking, am I reading this right? Time to kill God from the New York Times? Biggest city in America, the biggest newspaper in America, reaches more people than anybody else in the world, and I'm reading them say, it's time to kill God. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is how my Easter started now, because I'm mad. And I'm showing her, and I'm telling her, I want to show you God, and I'm just running back and forth, but I'm not. All right, but anyway, that's how my week started out today. And then we get here to this lovely breakfast, and then, of course, Joe and I get the call, right? So Joe and I have to go. And so nothing's going right today, <laughs> all right, up until now. Anyway, that's the way it is. So I know that I've had a week. You say that you had a week. But for sure, Jesus Christ has had a week, right? There is no doubt that Jesus had a week starting with Holy or uh, Sunday, uh, Palm Sunday, sorry, just grab it here, and then ending and culminating to today. So when I think of Jesus' week, I better not be whining about anything. Not one thing should I be whining about. So when I'm starting to whine, just, just remind me about who really had a week of chaos. <laughs> <laughs> Let me pray real quick and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful, beautiful day with these beautiful people. We get together and just praise your name. To praise your name, to worship you, Father, to give you the thanks and the glory for everything that's happened in this world. Father, this is all to your glory. And Father, please help me with my words today as I speak. I just want to represent what you once said. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Easter, everyone. Happy Easter. Now today we come to the end of our series, The Last 48, and since today is Easter, naturally, we would end this series on the resurrection, right, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now if you attended Bible study this morning, you're going to think I stole my sermon from that guy right there, alright, so, but I didn't. I don't think I did, Jerry, so it's going to be similar somewhat, but please, you're going to hear some words you already heard this morning here, uh, which is a good thing. I don't think you can talk too much about it. He sold this from you. Oh, is that what it was? He took it from me. Well done, Brittany, well done. <laughs> All right, so now this year, I want to speak about what actually happened that day that he was resurrect resurrected. So put yourself back there. In front of the tomb, walking up to the tomb, somewhere in that region. Put yourself wearing the sandals and the robe and the whole nine yards. You are in that area right now. And then I'm going to finish today with the impact of his reappearance. So that's what we're going today with our sermon. We're going to start out by reading the entire chapter of Matthew 28. So if you want, turn your Bibles to Matthew 28. Keep your... Keep your fingers there because we're going to be in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John today. All of them. We're just going to cover all the bases, all right? But as you turn there, let me start reading Matthew chapter 28. Now, after the Sabbath, as it had begun to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the tomb. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook from fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen just as he said he would do. Come, see the place where he is lying, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, 
he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Rejoice! And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go bring word to my brothers to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Now while they were on their way, some of the men from the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. And he said, you are to say, his disciples came at night and stole him while you were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and keep you guys out of trouble. And they took the money as they did, as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is still told to this day. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated to them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow that all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always till the end of age. It's the entire chapter right there. It tells the whole story, doesn't it? Now, the opening words of chapter 28 tell us when the events of the next few verses occur. It was the first day of the week. It's what we Westerners call Sunday. Mary Magdalene and the woman called the other Mary. Now, she is the one who in the previous chapter was identified as the mother of Jacob and Joseph. So you have two Marys going on here. Most people think the other Mary is Jesus' mother. And they went while it was still dark to visit the tomb where Christ's corpse was placed. These same two women were, among other Jews, present at the site of the crucifixion as Jesus hung dying on the cross. I can't get that image from last night out of my head. It's just, that's, that's how I think of it. I don't know, but that's just how I think of it. Now, just as there had been an earthquake at the moment of Jesus giving up his spirit, so now another earthquake occurs around the time of the women's arrival at the tomb. Matthew connects this earthquake to an angel arriving on the scene, whereby the rock closing the opening was rolled away, exposing the entrance into this tomb. The angel, quite visible and no doubt frightening in appearance, because that's what it says, sat upon the stone that had been moved to the side. <clears throat> Excuse me. Saying that the angel's appearance was like lightning must have been referring to the suddenness of his appearance, right? Like lightning, it was that sudden. Because it's not the description of the angel. We see the description of the angel later and what he looked like when we read what? And his clothing as white as snow. Did you know, did you know guys, that the Gospel of Mark, however, tells a somewhat different version of this same event. Did you know that? Let's read Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might come and anoint him. And very early on, the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb for us? And looking up, they noticed that the stone had been rolled away, for it was extremely large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. So since neither Matthew nor Mark were not eyewitnesses to the crucifixion, because I contend this is not the Matthew, disciple Matthew because of earlier writings, and since both of these Gospels were written at least 30 years after the fact, then clearly these two guys are getting their information from different sources. That is clear. In Mark, there is no earthquake that is mentioned. In Mark, three women went to the tomb. In Matthew, 
two women went to the tomb. And in Mark, there is no direct explanation for how the tomb had been opened. And there was a young man dressed in all white, not sitting outside on the entrance boulder, but rather inside in the tomb next to where Jesus had been laid. We are all left to decide who this young man is, right? Who is this young man? Now, I don't think we need to really fret over any of these differences that we see. We can't quiz the original authors, right? We can't hammer them with questions. We can't pepper them. So the why and the wherefore can be nothing but our guesses. But friends, to be intellectually honest, to be truthful about what the Bible says, we cannot pretend there are not any dif differences in these versions. Because there is. It is in plain text right in front of us. Now we don't need to run from these differences. It's not a big deal. The precise details of the tomb opening and why the women came, and even how many women were present, it's not crucial to the point of the story. What's the crucial part? The tomb is empty. That's the crucial part. So as we continue back in Matthew, we have to mention the guards, those Roman guards that I get mad at watching on TV yesterday. <laughs> oh, I'm getting mad about that. They had witnessed the earthquake, the stone being rolled away, and the sudden presence of this terrifying apparition that Matthew says is an angel. Next, some of the most profound words of the entire New Testament are spoken by this angel. He says that the woman should not be afraid. Now, he was referring to the suddenness of his appearance, right? He's telling them, don't be afraid. He really knows why they came to the tomb. It was to look for Jesus, who had been crucified. He next says that Jesus isn't there. He isn't there in the tomb because why? Because he was raised, just as he said he would be, just as he prophesied that he would be. So the angel provides the reason that Jesus isn't there. That's it. His body wasn't taken. Nobody took the body. It came alive again and was raised. Now the angel invites the women into the tomb to see that no one was there, and they were to quickly run and tell the 11 disciples about what had happened. Obviously, the 11 disciples had not scattered throughout the entire land after they disowned Jesus. Because the women were told to go and find them and to tell them what happened. So they must have been nearby. They would not have traveled all over the place. The women were also to tell the disciples that Jesus is going to be in the Galilee again, just as Jesus prophesied before he died. He said, I will be with you again in the Galilee. Now, that's it, folks. What was just described is very brief. It's very short on details. And it also leaves out perhaps the most puzzling matter that every one of us probably wants to know about. And that is the resurrection itself. We have no information on how it happened or what it looked like as it unfolded inside of that tomb. The resurrection is given as a fact, and that's it. Nothing more. Just a fact. We're not really told by Matthew that Jesus arose on the first day of the week. We're only told that the tomb opened on that day and that he was already gone. Mark doesn't say that Christ arose on the third day. But you all believe it, right? I do, because Luke settles the matter, all right? Luke says, when we read in 24-7 this, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be executed on a stake as a criminal, but on the third day be raised again. So the ambiguity that you find in Matthew and Mark about Christ's resurrection, it's settled by Luke. Now I do want to take a small detour here, folks. You know I like to do that. I want you to consider the timeline of the events that have just taken place. Excuse me, sorry. Using Western terminology, standard Western terminology for the days of the week, this is the usual Christian timeline we hear spoken of for Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus was killed and placed into the tomb on Friday, and he arose on Sunday. Everybody's heard that, right? Everybody has heard that. But how can that be? How can that be, friends? How can that add up to three days and three nights to fulfill the prophetic sign of Jonah? 
Do you remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12? When we read 39 and 40 this, Jesus said this, But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves a sign, and so no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was in the stomach of the sea monster for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of earth for three days and three nights. So how can we get our question to add up, folks? The answer is, it can't add up, right? Now, I'm no math major. I'm no math major at all. But no man of clever spin can ever give us three nights in the tomb if he died on a Friday. If he died Friday, Friday night is one night. Saturday, Saturday night is two nights. <coughs> Sunday, he arose. That's two days, and or three days and two nights, isn't it? So it doesn't add up, does it? Have you ever thought about that? It doesn't add up. But the solution is simple, friends. Don't get mad. All right? And it centers around the Jewish calendar of that time, not the Western calendar of this time. Our calendar today uses a 24-hour format, right? Day begins at midnight, and the day ends at the following midnight. That's not the calendar the Jews use. They do use a 24-hour calendar, but their day starts at sunset, not at midnight. And it ends the following sunset, not at midnight. Now, we're not going to go down this rabbit hole today because today is about resurrection. Perhaps at a later time we can address this timeline issue. And I understand what I just said may ruffle your feathers, but don't let it ruffle your feathers, guys. I just challenge you to get in-depth with your Bible study. When you're reading the Bible, pay attention to what's being written so you can talk about this kind of stuff. Because this is what's in front of us. Now, verse 8 continues with the women dutifully obeying the angel's instructions to run and find the disciples and to tell them the news. The women were shaken and badly frightened by what they had just witnessed. But they were also conflicted in emotion as they were filled with joy as well as because, uh, sorrow because of the death of their Lord. All right? So, but their joy was what? Why were they joyous? It is, they were joyful because it seems like Jesus' death has been turned into victory if he was resurrected, right? If he was raised. Now, I encourage you all to read the four gospel accounts of the day of resurrection so you can see all these different versions going on. You, if you read them all together, you're going to notice some differences in their stories. You can't deny it. If you're intellectually honest, the versions of Jesus' resurrection differ in the Gospels. So if that's a true statement, folks, which one of the four Gospel accounts gets the details of this event most correct? Was it three women who went to the tomb, or was it two? Which one? Can't be both, right? <laughs> so which one was it? Which one? Each one is a little different than the others. Here's my thought process. It's reasonable to conclude that John's account would be the most accurate. Why, do you ask? Because I know you're asking why. Because John would have heard the story directly from the mouths of those excited women. He was there. John was the only gospel writer that was part of Christ's first followers. So that's the one I'm going with, because he would have heard it directly from their mouths instead of 30 years later as Mark and Matthew did. So let's talk about the resurrection itself, which to my thinking is the core upon our belief system. It's the core of why we believe Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Paul says without Jesus' resurrection, our faith is in vain. Yet it might surprise you to know that not all Christian denominations believe in resurrection. Some denominations don't believe in any kind of resurrection. Not even the soul. Some or others believe that Jesus was resurrected, but it was his soul only and not his body. This even includes the possibility of Jesus only being in soul and not in body. For some of the older denominations, like the Baptists, there are splits in their resurrection beliefs. They can be traced back to the European Enlightenment back in the 18th century. 
So the Baptists are split on what they believe in resurrection. Why are there so many different views on resurrection? Why? Here's why. It's due to the insistence that the modern era and the Bible must agree with science. Or that better yes, the Bible must conform to science. Scientifically speaking, since resurrection is a miracle, and since miracles cannot be reproduced or proven in a laboratory, then there can be no such thing as a miracle. That's why there's so many different beliefs on religion or on resurrection. It's alarming if you do the study, folks, how many different views on resurrection there are. Now, I don't know what your stance is. I don't know what your stance is because we haven't talked about it directly. But I want to tell you what my stance is because I'm the one up here talking. I am 100% positive, 100% positive that I know what every Christian should believe about resurrection. And that should be this. Since I take the Bible as inspired, truthful, and literal, I can confidently tell you that Jesus died on the cross, His dead body was placed in a tomb, and on the third day, the Father in heaven miraculously resurrected Him, both body and soul. That is not debatable. It's no way. If you believe anything else, you are blasphemous. In my opinion. So please, study what you're doing, because... If you believe that you can't both be resurrected body and soul, you got a problem with Jesus. That's for sure. Now, it's important to know about resurrection and stances on resurrection because in Judaism, it is not a new thing. Now, while so often the concept of resurrection is taught within the church as a new Christian thing, something different that is apart from the Judaism of Christ Day or from the Old Testament, the fact is, friends, that resurrection is not new at all. Such a thing was completely within the broad spectrum of Jewish theology of Jesus' day. It had been a part of the Hebrew faith for hundreds of years. But just like Christianity, the Jews did what we do. And that is create many different various views of resurrections. They did the same thing, they just did it first. We need to understand what the Jewish mindset about resurrection was back in Jesus' day to understand why some passages are written the way they are in Scripture. The Sadducees and Pharisees disagreed on the subject of resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. But different groups of Pharisees believed variously, either in spirit and body together, or spirit only, or body only. They all differed. Therefore, the concerns about resurrection from a Sadducee and a Pharisee were different. The Sadducees truly believed that since resurrection was not possible, <clears throat> excuse me, then the only way that Christ's body could go missing is if his disciples took it. That's what they believed. That's the Sadducees. <clears throat> excuse me. Let, me. let me pull a note us here. <laughs> The Pharisees, however, they had different and mixed motives. While they were afraid that Jesus' disciples indeed might come and steal the body, they also couldn't dismiss the idea that he could be resurrected. And that would be a problem if he was to be resurrected. Because what would they do if there was a resurrected Jesus wandering around Jerusalem at that point, right? What would they do? Certainly that would threaten their authority over those crowds of people they had, right? If Jesus really resurrected and was walking around Jerusalem, that crowd being an uproar, those Pharisees would have lost their power and their authority, and the world would have turned out different, right? That's why they were afraid. Ancient Hebrew writers of the Old Testament spoke about people of God dying and then being raised again. One example is in Job. Is Job widely considered the oldest book in the Bible by most people? It is, isn't it? It is widely considered the oldest book in the Bible. Let's read Job. Job. Did I say Job? Uh, okay, I was struggling here. Let's read Job chapter 14 real quickly. Read this. As water evaporates from the sea and a river becomes parched and dried up, so a man lies down and does not rise. Until the heavens no longer exist, he will not awake nor be woken from his sleep. 
Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, that you would conceal me until your wrath returns, that you would set a limit for me and remember me. If a man dies, will he live again? All the days of my struggle, I will wait until my relief comes. Job is talking about resurrection here in the oldest book in the Bible. The prophets Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they talked about resurre resurrection. And they believed for the most part that resurrection was for Israelites only. That's not good news for us, is it? <laughs> right? In addition, the prophet Daniel spoke extensively about resurrection. But it appears he included Gentiles in his writings. Yay for us, right? <laughs> All right so. so there were different views within Judaism on resurrection, just as there's disagreement between Christians on resurrection. Another disagreement of resurrection is centered around a human being being a moral unit. It is a body, and it's a soul, and it's a moral unit. And you can only separate a moral unit to a certain degree, but you can't permanently separate it. So there is a moral unit that's connected here with resurrection. They disagreed on that as well. Our hope in Christ then, my friends, is not only about His resurrection, that's an already established fact, right? We know He was resurrected. Our hope is not only in His resurrection, but it's also a matter of our resurrection. And specifically, it's about our resurrection into what? If we're going to be resurrected, what are we going to be resurrected into? Resurrection gradually came to be seen as a central part of the coming Messianic kingdom, otherwise known as the kingdom of God. Resurrection and the kingdom of God go hand in hand. But again, don't forget, to the Jews, resurrection and the kingdom of heaven, of course, only extends to the Israelites. In the spirit of saving time, I want you guys to please jot down and read Daniel 12, 1 and Revelation 20, 1 through 6. It's in your brochure. You're going to get extensive views on resurrection from a Jewish perspective. Now, over time, after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, and when the priesthood became disbanded, rabbis, back then, became the new driving force of theology in Judaism. And they concluded at that time that resurrection can be for anyone, not just Jewish people. But in Jesus' day, the Jews believed in resurrection, just that us Gentiles were not included. Keep that tucked away in the back of your mind. So there is nothing particularly innovative with resurrection within Jewish heritage. And so believing someone could be resurrected is not an issue. It is not. Everybody says it's a miracle. Everybody says it's the issue. But my friends, God created everything. God created everything. It is not hard for me to fathom God taking a dead person and making them alive again. God creates, He created everything, and he, cre he can recreate. It is not an issue for God to do that. What is new is this, friends. What is new is simply this about Easter. It's announcing that the Messiah of the Messianic area has arrived. What is new is that this person who has arrived was brutally killed. What is new is that this new person that's been announced is the one who was brutally slain and is now resurrected. What is new is this person who is the announced Messiah. Who is this announced Messiah? We know who He is, don't we? It's Jesus of Nazareth. That's what's new. Jesus of Nazareth. He is the fulfillment of God's plan of salvation for everyone. Not just Jews, not just Gentiles, for everyone. The resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is proof that He is the one who is the Messiah. Amen? He's the Messiah. That's the new thing. Now let's return back to Matthew 28 real quickly. Verse 11 explains that the Roman, guard to, that the Roman guards had been frozen in fear. They went into Jerusalem and told a senior priest what had just happened. 
The priest met with the Pharisee leadership, and together they decided the best course of action was to bribe the Roman guards to lie. They were to say that indeed the disciples stole Jesus' body. That's why it's really gone. Why did the elites care if Jesus was resurrected? Why did they even care? Again, it's because in Jewish heritage back then, resurrection is always associated with the kingdom of God. These elites knew, they knew, that if the resurrection really happened, it proved that Jesus was the Messiah. They did everything that they could think of to hide the fact that he was indeed the Messiah by giving money to the guards to lie about, right? That's what's going on here. Now we get to the best part of Matthew, I think. Jesus now takes front and center in the last five verses of chapter 28. Jesus takes front and center. Please pay attention to this last section. This is the glory of God on display. This is a big deal. I believe the reason the written story of the resurrection is so short because it is, Matthew chapter 28 has three verses about the resurrection itself. The reason why it's so short as compared to the written story of his whole life is simple to explain. Because that's the reality, right? 27 chapters of Matthew dedicated to Jesus living and three sentences about his resurrection. Think about what's going on here, folks. The reason that's happening is simple. It's because all of us believers... All of us are supposed to focus on what he did while he was alive much more than his resurrection. That's why there's so much written about it. I believe this is because of what Jesus says in these last five sentences. Or that's, that's five verses. In verse 16, I'm sorry, I'm getting really dry here. Now. In verse 16, the disciples traveled to the mountain in Galilee, which was designated by Jesus, right? Jesus said, you will meet me there. The mountain is a symbol of authority in Jewish culture. That's why the mountain is, men is mentioned, because now we're going to switch to authority. And what we see next in verse 17 is extremely crucial, friends. It is the true definition of salvation. Let me say that again. Verse 17 is the true definition of salvation. Understand that what we have going on here at this moment in time is the same thing every one of us goes through and every one of those people out there in the world goes through when deciding to follow Jesus. Jesus was killed to punish sin and God resurrected him which proved who he was. These disciples at that time have now experienced the teaching of their master. They saw him put to death because of who he was. And they have now witnessed the resurrection. And so they now have a choice to make. That's what's going on here in these last five verses. They have a choice to make. My friends, here in verse 17, we learn what that choice is. Either you experience Jesus in a real way and you believe him, or you experience Jesus and you doubt. That's what's going on here on the mountain. If you choose to believe, understand, it is not enough to just say, Lord, Lord. It is not enough to say, Jesus, you are my Lord. You have to worship Him. That's what Jesus is saying right here. You have to worship Him, Jesus of Nazareth, as the divine Son of God. At this point, we see some of those disciples are confronted in a very real way about what is going on in their life. A few of them are struggling with doubt. That's the same thing that happens today. And a few of them are struggling with this doubt. It's, I'm telling you, nothing has changed between then and now. Most people hear the story of Jesus Christ and they are doubtful that Jesus is the Son of God. And you know it's true because you see it out there in the world, don't you? You know it's true. Now at this moment, Jesus tells them He is the one who has been given what? All authority of heaven and earth by His Father. This fulfills the prophecy of Daniel. When we read Daniel 7 verses 13 and 14 this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, 
one like the Son of Man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days. Who's the Ancient of Days? That's God. And was presented before him. And to him was given dominion. Who's he given dominion to? Jesus Christ. Honor and a kingdom, so that all peoples, nations, and populations, so that everyone of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. It's prophecy being fulfilled this last section of Matthew. What we have happening here in verse 18 is the glory of God on full display. Jesus Christ is doing what sons do. Jesus Christ is doing what sons do. What do sons do? They take over the work of their father. A resurrected Jesus is now purposely, he's now obediently, he is now carrying out the plan of salvation of his father. That's what's going on here after resurrection. Jesus Christ is the name above all names. Amen? He's the name above all names. To the glory of God, to the glory of God, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what's going on here, friends. Amen? Amen? He is the authority of God. He is now taking leadership of the plan of salvation. Based on His authority, and based on His authority, He does what next? He commands disciples to do something. He commands the disciples to do what? To go out into the world and make more disciples. And to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, friends, don't, don't miss this. Jesus says to his imperfect disciples, they're not perfect, they're just like us. They have doubts just like us. They screw up just like us. And he says to those disciples who are full of flaws, and likewise, he's telling you and he's telling me. He's telling all of us, all of us who are riddled with flaws, to get out there. Now, to go. Get out there and make more disciples. That's what he's saying. So, what is a disciple, friends? What is it we're supposed to do? A disciple isn't a person who just sits in a pew and claims that Jesus is Lord and goes to church. That's not what a disciple is. A disciple doesn't just convert to Jesus. They convert their mind, they convert their behavior, and they conduct or they convert their conduct to that of their master. That's what a disciple does. Our master is Jesus Christ. He also commands those defective original disciples and us defective disciples to go and teach the new disciples to follow everything he commands. That's what the Master says to do. Now what has His ministry, what has Jesus' ministry, His teachings, throughout His entire life commanded? What has Jesus commanded in His entire ministry? What are we supposed to do and teach? It's simply this. To stop doing it your way. Stop doing God your way. Stop living the way the world says to live. And go. And go back to learning how to love God properly. To go back and learn how to love your fellow man properly. To go back and learn how to live a righteous life that pleases Him. That's what Jesus Christ is commanding us to do. Go out and get other people to do the same thing. And we are also supposed to do one more thing, friends, and what is that? We are to teach everyone that Jesus is the Son of God sent to fulfill the plan of salvation. That's what we are supposed to do. And then Jesus gives us perhaps the most comforting words ever spoken to any of us. He says, in essence, this. Don't worry about Satan. Don't worry about the world out there. Because He, Jesus Christ, is always with us. Always with us. He will never leave us. He will never abandon us. He will never forsake us. He is always with us till the end of age. Amen? Amen. Amen. No doubt about it, because He said He was. Easter is our celebration as the proof that the Messiah has arrived. There is no doubt that the Messiah is Jesus of Nazareth. And this truth changes everything. 
as we celebrate this truth today and we absorb the comfort of his statement about him being with us until the end of age, how can we not ask ourselves these following questions? Did the death and resurrection of Jesus change us? Did his death change us individually? If so, is our change noticeable to everyone else? How about this one? If his death and resurrection changed us, do we proclaim to everyone we see out loud that Jesus is the Messiah who is our Lord and Master? Friends, the final question is, do we do what disciples are supposed to do? Do we do that? That begs the question of this last chapter 28. Praise God for His mercy. Praise God for His compassion, His love, and especially for His plan of salvation, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. We praise out and we'll sing. Heavenly Father, I have no words to express the gratitude that I have, the thankfulness that I have for what you have done for us. I, I don't know what to say, Father, except just thank you. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for forgiving these people. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to bear that cup of wrath for us. I, I don't know what to say, Father. I do know this. I love you. I will follow you till the day I die, no doubt. And I'll proclaim to anybody that's listening, Jesus Christ is Lord, no doubt about it. Heavenly Father, I just pray for these people as we exit these doors that everyone who sees us going forward understands exactly what we just learned from us. In precious name I pray, amen. <laughs>